Thank you. Thank you, Diana. So, uh, freedom versus subordination. Well, it's easier said than done. So, we are ready to talk about are you ready, maybe you as people or you as organizations, to work in the post-industrial era? So we're going to draw on you know, the two keynotes given by Tim and Esco. And of course, Nilofer, you, you gave us a very interesting talk yesterday morning uh, about how we should not replicate the uh, Californian Promethean entrepreneurial ideo ideology mythology here. So maybe work in the post-industrial world is not about being an entrepreneur. Maybe it's not that, that simple. Uh, Maybe I'll give a few uh, say a few words about you guys. Well, I mean, for people who have the uh, memory span of a goldfish. <laughs> so Neil, short. Yeah, yeah, because you you were here. That was you, yeah, like 20 <laughs> minutes ago. Uh, yeah, I mean, because you, you you had remote, you did not have the jacket, so it's kind of confusing, you know. <laughs> so Neil, of, uh, you, along your 20-year career, you've been nicknamed the Jane Jane Bond of innovation. So you'll tell me if it comes with a license to kill in a very fast <laughs> car, but I hope not, not for today. But, uh, well, your latest book was published in 2012 and was entitled 11 Rules for Creating Value in the Social Era. So we, we're kind of seeing where we're headed here. And uh, which was designated by Fast Company with an, one of the best business books of the year. So no, no pressure, guys. Okay, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, Team Leverage, so you're the business romantic. You just told us about... Uh, how we should put romanticism back into capitalism, which is easier said than done, of course. And uh, well, maybe, you know, it's kind of the Sturmontang era right now, you know, the pre-romantic era, so I hope so. And Esco Kibli, so head of Esco Kibli Company, you're from uh, Helsinki, and uh, basically your company is about uh, getting researchers and strategists to work hand in hand to actually understand what it means to work in the post-industrial era, for, but also to actually help companies uh, maneuver in, in this new context. So, I've already talked too much, but I'll just frame, you know, the, um, the problem we have here. You know, when we talk about the industrial era, I always think about Charlie Chaplin, you know, in his uh, 1936 classic, The Modern Times, you know, where it was, uh, uh, what was the name of this character in English? It's not Charlot, in French we call him Charlot. But I discovered it's Little Trump in English. But you know, this guy crushed in the cogs in a gigantic uh, factory. So that's really what work was about at the industrial era. And you're being, I mean, putting men and women as parts of the big machinery. That's why we invented subordination. That's why we invented wage labor. You know, because at the end of the day, what you expect from an employee is to obey, to do what's expected of him, no more, no less. And so my question would be, I mean, Esco was just talking about asymmetrical relationships and symmetrical relationships. So my first question would be, well, I mean, that, get, get, that's the main question, that the hot topic here. Are we really done, are we really done with subordination? I mean, is it a new era or maybe it's just a con continuation through the, what you call the algorithmic new type of capitalism? But first, you know, for yesterday you told us that we should not blindly replicate this old mythology of uh, Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. So it, it's not enough to wear sneakers and shorts and to have a ping pong table at, at the office to, to enter this new work paradigm? I'm quite... <laughs> it's certainly not the outfit. Although I think um, if you ever go to South by Southwest, which is this conference based in Austin, everyone's acting like they're so um, rebellious and yet they all look identical with their checkered shirts. And I'm like, I don't know why it doesn't occur to us. That's not the way to live. Um, so just two things that I think are really um, important for the modern times, and, and this is tied to the book that I wrote. I basically argued two things have to happen at the same time. One is that each of us gets to operate from a place I've labeled onlyness. So just to define that, each of us stands in a spot in the world only you stand in, which is a function of your history and experience, visions and hopes. It's from that place in which we eat, cre each create value. But it's not, at, and so just so I'm really clear, it's not like you're doing it all alone. So the second part of it is, now you can work in either a decentralized or distributed model so that each of us can actually be manifest in that construct. But it means that you actually have to allow people agency and independence and learning and passion, as Tim would say, uh, so that they can actually express themselves but still go in some direction that is a shared direction. And so both parts have to be true. You have to set up the organizational construct to allow that. 
and actually each of us have to have our own sense of what is it we're here for, what is the meaning we choose to put to our work, and so how do we show up fully alive? And that's our individual responsibility. Both parts have to happen. When I've been working with leaders for many years, they'll argue that, uh, so here's, here's how the talk goes. I'll give a talk, and then the very top CEO leadership will say, well, I would change if only they would change. And then if you talk to people deeper within the organization, they'll say, well, I would change if only they would change. And, and I'm just trying to show that systemically, the individual and the system have to start working in some loop that actually is better for both parties. That's actually a very romantic idea in a way because that's quite contrary. You know, being an employee meant that you had a job description, that you were a function, that you were, you could be replaced. You know, someone was waiting and could take your job. It was not you as a person, not you. I mean, I like this concept of onlyness. I'm sure, Tim, it, it reason, resonates a lot about your romantic idea because romantics were the one who brought back, you know, the concept of self know, of self-accomplishment, of authorship into the intellectual European uh, mindset. So how do you, what do you think about this idea of onlyness? I like it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think we all I have a common... I wanted them to fight on stage, uh, but uh, they like each other too I much. I think we, we have a lot of overlap, right, with our themes in terms of um, uh, the social element. I think what you said about uh, interactions and relationships, work means to create relationships really resonated with me. Um, there's a great quote by the philosopher Robert Solomon who says... Um, um, you know, the economy is not a marketplace, it's much more a sympathetic community for social exchange, which is, I think, very much along the lines of, of, of what you said. But to your question, um, the self, I, I think one of the reasons why I'm so fascinated with romanticism is that it's very ambivalent, right? There's uh, a, definitely a dark side to romanticism as well. So, in fact, there are, there are several. But one is romanticism is very much about the self and ind individualism, right? And you could argue at what point does sort of this obsession with the self become uh, just sort of the, the opposite of collaboration? At one point, do you become an asshole, right? If you're, if you're really an exuberant romantic, I think that's one fine line um, that romantics have to navigate. Like um, Musset, for instance. When Musset in Daily Life must have been a terrible asshole. Well, I mean, yeah. Steve Jobs, right? Or I mean, there's, yeah, there's uh, uh, the quintessential romantic uh, among... Dr. Frankenstein. Yeah. Frankenstein is another uh, great example, or Lord Byron, uh, if you will. Is, is another one. And I think uh, the other uh, sort of dark side of this, this you know, the self and the, 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 the empowerment of the individual is yes, it is great if we're now empowered uh, and we no longer have to do mechanical objective tasks, right, that are no longer part of the industrial society. But what that means is that pressure, performance pressure is shifting to subjective tasks. So how much of our work is now uh, internal brand management, perception management, right? Building currency, showing up. In fact, having the pressure to show up with our authentic selves because you're not authentic, right? You do not perform and you don't build relationships, then uh, you will not succeed, you know, at the workplace, I think, that we're, we're entering. So I'm not, you know, it's not per se bad or good. But I'm just saying there, it's more complex and the nature of work is changing. Um, and uh, as much as that might liberate, it also adds new pressures um, to our uh, persona at work. Nidofa, you wanted to react? So, to so two things. I actually respond really negatively to the term empowerment. And, and I just want to have us challenge that word for a minute because it assumes that it comes from outside of us. And I don't know about you, but I have never used the, t the word empowerment with a white man, for example. I never say, by the way, Tim, you need to be empowered. But I hear it a lot with groups that are underserved, when in reality they actually have a great deal of capacity that we've actually limited. So the word I prefer is how do you actually enable that which already is? And how do you actually build the scaffolding in the organization that lets those people show up? And scaffolding just lets people bring what they have, right? So I assume resident innate capability in the system, and I wish more organizations did, because I think what we mostly assume is that people are stupid, that they need to be told. And I actually don't think most people are stupid nowadays. Esco, I think you wanted to react because you were talking about symmetrical relations and asymmetrical relations. And I think it resonates a lot with what, what Tim was saying about, you know, you may not have a boss, but there is a strong social pressure, new kinds of pressure appearing, which means it's not like, uh, you know, it's not paradise regained. I'd like to start by uh, defending industrialism. Because ab Please do. actually, it was the right answer to the questions that were asked 100 years ago. And uh, 
industrialism has created tremendous wealth and well-being and raised millions and millions of people from poverty. But what has happened is that it has turned from creating value to extracting value. So the time is over. And I think none of the models are applicable anymore. So we have to create a new language, we have to create the new designs, we have to create the new post-industrial narrative, as I claimed during my, my opening words. So you just have to forget, as, as Nilofer so rightly put it, you have to forget words like empowerment, because that's an industrial asymmetric relations word. As a concept, it's not symmetrical because you don't empower anybody in symmetrical relations. And this is the real task for us, is to, is to be very specific about the words we use and be very specific about the goals and aims we have, and even more specific about the values we want to work for and fight for. But are, are we really done? Yeah, Tim, I want, I, want to, I want to hear you on that. Are we really done with industrialism? Because you, you were pointing, you know, you were talking about this all algorithmic obsession. And so far, it's like technology has not lived up to our expectations. We are using technology, information technology, to increase control. You know, this all lust for control of capitalism. Uh, we are just, you know, asking more and more reporting for people and just monitoring there. I mean, you were talking about the quantified self even for sex, for God's sake. I mean, so it's like, you know, it's uh, all the industrial, industrial mindset is just spreading pervasively into our new world. So. What's going on here? I think that's a true observation. I mean, that's as Goa, you pointed out as well. Um, and it's interesting, just a, a, a statistic, uh, one out of 10 jobs right now has e existed 100 years ago, right? And the tech industry in the past 10 years has only created 5% of new jobs, right? Despite uh, GDP growth and, and really exuberant uh, uh, profits, right? So, I mean, this is just a little bit of a reality check to your point. Like how fast are we advancing? How is, is that new paradigm of the post-industrial work really uh, prevalent across the board? I think it's going to take a little bit longer. And if you look at the number one job in the United States, it's you know truck driver, secretary, right, cashier. So there's still very uh, sort of mechanical uh, uh, jobs. So I think we're we are all prone. I certainly am uh, living in San Francisco to sort of looking a little bit at inside the bubble and then projecting what we see sort of the avant-garde of, of new economic paradigms and projecting it out and assuming that's already the case elsewhere. But I think it'll take, it'll take some time. It will take time. Uh, Nilofer, where are we in the, are we, have we entered the social era? Uh, the one you're talking about in your book? Or I think we are, and I think we are entering the social era. For those of us that can apply our creativity, that can show independent judgment, that can actually use our own ideas, we're gonna benefit. The risk um, is that the truck driver is gonna be replaced by an Uber type technology. The secretary can be automated. And so, it, I don't know if you know the statistics, but in the United States, the amount of work that is called creative work, so the someone who's applying independent judgment, using their own ideas, et cetera, is in a generous count, 40%. That means that 60% of the economy is at risk which actually means, by the way, that our entire society is at risk. Because as soon as you no longer believe that you have a place in that house, you will burn down the house, which, by the way, explains Donald Trump. Right? You will burn down the house because you believe it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because if, if it doesn't work for me, it doesn't work for anyone. Right? And um, by the way, the, the international number, because I just asked Richard Florida, who's the source of that data, who wrote the book on creative class, we're doing some shared research together about the intersection between onlyness and creative class. So I asked him what the international number was, and it was 16%. So 40% so of the US is creative economy, 16% globally, which is counting um, a lot of industrialized nations, so you can see the mix. Um, that's a, th so the scary part is the 84%. What do you do when you can automate all those people and that they don't have any work? You have people in Saudi Arabia, I think the unemployment rate for sub-25 is something like 50%. That explains why you have jihadists, right? If you suddenly give people a reason, a purpose to their life when they don't have an alternative, you have violence. And so when none of us can actually show up with our onlyness in a productive fashion, if the scaffolding doesn't exist for the economy, we actually are putting all ourselves at risk. So I, I want you to think about it in two lenses, right? One is the individual, how do you show up and use your creativ 
creativity and your judgment, because that is the work we need to do. That is how we end up creating value. And the second is, how do we take care of our brothers and sisters in our modern economy? Because if we do not, that's why I was giving the talk yesterday, I think we're so bought into a system that says, winner takes all. And when you say winner takes all, and you, then we have no society left at the end of that story. I think we'll get to this idea. You got the audience convinced. I think we'll get later to, I want to go deeper on this, uh, you know, societal consequences of the potential end of work. But first, uh, you, you talked about purpose. You know, work was also at the individual level about having a purpose, you know, doing something with your life, being useful to society as a whole. And, you know, I, I don't remember, I don't know if you've read this article, it was about three or two or three years ago by the anthropologist David Greber about bullshit jobs, you know, the fact that people who, because lots of people are going out of job, but people who have a job still just feel like they are useless, that they have no, their job, their daily life, their daily work routine creates zero social value. And this is a very psychologically damaging phenomenon. So w what would be your take on that? Maybe Tim and Esco, if you want to react on that as well? Go first, ask. Yeah. Um, so purpose is interesting, and I, for my book, I've, I've talked to a lot of people who work for purpose-driven, mission-driven organizations or nonprofit, and I think one observation is that there's often a, a gulf between the lofty purpose and the mission that everybody buys into, and that is very important. But then how it is experienced and manifest every day in the workplace, and if that link isn't there, of course, there's a huge potential for frustration, and it falls, uh, and it falls flat. And purpose also is also per se. It's a neutral term, right? So you could argue, um, Nilofer, to your point, right? ISIS uh, is a purposeful organization. Goldman Sachs, you know, it has a very strong purpose. It's not the meaning of life, but, but it's, it's not about the meaning doing of life. something, right? I think what is key is that um, besides manifesting that in a, in, a, in a human, delightful, I would call it a romantic workplace experience, is I think not only the wish to transform organizations, but also the ability to transform the members of the organization, truly really transform selves in the process. I think I would maybe qualify that as a, as a uh, characteristic as well uh, of a purposeful, <coughs> purposeful organization. I think one great example is, um, I was sort of thinking about this case of Chobani, the, the yogurt maker, right? You, you may have heard that the CEO decided relatively out of the blue, I mean, really out of the blue actually, to hand out stock to his employees. So I, I thought it was kind of interesting. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, some disputed and said, well, he did that because of the private equity investors to dilute and whatnot. I don't think it even matters what the mo motivations were. I, I think it was very successful and resonated, not only because it, it served a purpose or it was in, in line with the mission of the company, but also because how he did it. And that's where the romantic part comes in. Uh, you know, rather than just doing a CSR report or donating, right, but this surprising move this oh my God moment of awe to say, well, you know, we don't want to do something completely unexpected and give you stock as gratitude for all the years that you worked for the company. I think that really made the difference. So uh, my, my, my suggestion for purpose of an organization is think really very carefully about how you translate the purpose into very, very sort of tactical everyday moments because the moments are incredibly powerful. Let's go. We work a lot with the flip side of the coin of the Nordic good social security and the problem is that if for mental or physical reasons you are out of the work life domain it's very very hard to get back in and what we try to do is we try to help people to get back into the society through technolo technology and augmented intelligence and the way we see purpose here is very different from the people or the person who's been sitting alone at home for a year and the purpose for her might be just to be with other people, be part of the society. And this is something that we don't understand, that purpose is not the same for everybody. It's very different things for very different people. So it can be, uh, you can be jobless and still have a purpose and still be working. I mean, it's not like your work life is just blocked into this concept of, old concept of job. But I, I mean, you're talking about, you were to, I, I, I read an article where you talk about uh, the fact about division of labor, and you were kind of defending industrialism, and I have to say, at least, you know, in the old paradigm, well, you knew what your job was, you know, you had a trade, you had learned, you had a specific, specific, uh, specific set of skills, and I have to say, you know, as a member of WeShare, uh, 
sometimes people ask me, What's, what do you do for a living? And I'm like, uh, you know, it's kind of, I'm a kind of a journalist. Slash, uh, I really w no, don't want to do so. It's really hard to express the social value and sometimes it's kind of alienating. So how do, uh, what can I do to have a so to be useful at a societal level and not to be alienated in this way, you know, what's my trade? Because in a way it's terrifying not to have any division of labor anymore, just to be picking and choosing everywhere like that. Well, first of all, I defended what was right 100 years ago. And the problem we face in many meetings like this is that we have the new tools, but our thinking is so outdated. And then, of course, uh, coming back to the, the question, we have uh, neuroscientists in our, our team, and, and what they claim is that the uh, industrial model of competence or competencies is really something that is not very good for human beings. Because few human beings, beings, what comes to our brains, are not meant to do one thing. We are meant to do very different things. And it may be, and this is something that we are not quite sure yet, because this is kind of study under progress or in progress, is that what if the future work is doing four or five things? What if you have several kind of streams of activities or many, many streams of activities where you get also your income? And that's quite interesting, but we don't have the results yet, so. So I'm not completely lost. Then. I totally want to hear that answer. So I think, I think to answer your specific question, um, I think there's two answers. So first for you, so if I was just looking at you and saying how would I ha handle that, I think a lot of us are doing this slash career thing. So we're journalists slash conference organizers slash writers slash whatever, right? Like this slash career. Uh, and it's all these hyphens. And I was doing, at one point, uh, research. I was a professor at Stanford. I was, you know, blah, like these different things. And somebody was like, well, what do you do? And I did the same blah, blah, blah. And, and, they, and, and another friend who happened to be standing there saying, you know, she's an expert on innovation. She's got 25 years of experience where he like, had to step in. You know, it was really kind of embarrassing that I could not describe my own thing. Um, and it's because we don't know how to describe the slash career. So that's the genesis, by the way, of the Jane Bond of innovation is out of that conversation. You have to create some handle and then on my bio you can, you can end up describing it because, you know, the thing is we have to claim whatever it is and just accept that and whatever that is for you. And we don't really have good ways of addressing that. So that's the first piece is just answering your question is how do we find our own story narrative, right? And the second thing that we're getting really confused by in society right now, and I, and I don't know the answer yet, this is actually something I'm really thinking about though, is we have two parts. One is value creation, and one is value capture. So I think of a lot of examples uh, where people are able to contribute that which they can, that benefits society, and there may or may not be money involved. And I'm like, okay, so if you could just focus on was there value created, and was someone able to create value, Goodness has happened, right? Society has benefited. Now the question is, economically, where is the transaction? Because right now all of our economics are based on a specific transaction. Our, our measurement of economic value of a country is measured by GDP, which is an output of a mechanical production, you know, so that if a box is made, we can measure that, but we can't measure the value of Tim writing a book other than the economic units sold through the output of the book, right? What is the value of him thinking deeply about business romanticism or his sharing that idea in this group? We don't know how to measure no that creative work. But the so, implications so of what you're saying are quite radical because in a way it means that our new value creation architecture is not compatible with the market economy. Well, I <laughs> think we have to find a different way to measure capability, which is different than output. Capability is a, it can, be, can be exchanged. Output is a specific mechanical thing. So there's a different form of economics around um, capability, and I think it's Armathya Sen who has probably the best thinking around that and about 40 economists following in his thread. I would argue I'm following in his thread of people who are trying to figure out what could the new measure be, but that's where more thinking needs to be done. I, I think, uh, no, I think that's right on. And, um, you know, Twitter is a curious case because Twitter, uh, if so many people say it's an abysmal failure, right? I mean, it's a $2 billion company, right? Uh, and, you know, with 140 characters, uh, Doug, Douglas Rushkoff, you know, it's, it's Douglas Rushkoff's argument saying, well, in any other time, in any other economy, the huge success, your, your parents would be really proud of you. But, and, and that's one thing. So there, our vocabulary and our framing is, is off there because we're so growth obsessed, right? But the second thing about Twitter I find really interesting is, Aside from the growth and aside from the revenue and the very limited set of metrics that we have available, 
Twitter is, in my view, tr producing tremendous value for societies, right? Whether you like the service or not, but there's something that is not measured. Uh, it's almost like an act of sort of um, emphatic communication, right? It's a beautiful, really beautiful um, a service. So I think we need to do two things. I think we need to come up with new metrics to, to measure uh, different kinds of value that is much more, um, having a much more sophisticated notion of value. There's also a tremendous amount of work that is unpaid, of course, right? So caring work, parenting work, um, that is very, very expensive. It's a measure of capabilities, not about output. Work. I mean, contributing a absolutely. on platforms on Wikipedia, for instance, or, that, or such Warcraft. Activities. But, but, and the other thing is, though, um, and that's sort of um, where the romantic comes in, uh, in addition to refining our tools to measure value, me measure different kinds of value, I think we also need to have an understanding that ultimately not everything can be measured, which means that we need to value what we cannot measure, like art. <laughs> you know, and we don't have to measure it quantitatively, but we need to find capacity to give it value. And I think that's going to be, um, you know, sort of the hallmark of a new kind of economy that I, I hope for. So basically, Nilofer just said that our new regime, uh, production regime, was not compatible with market, traditional market economy, and you just said that it wasn't compatible with capitalism in a way. So, and you guys came from San Francisco. You are leftists. <laughs> well, I grew up in Germany, so. I okay, so <laughs> that's all right. You, you're allowed to be a Marxist then. No, but that's really interesting because. It, it's like, you know, there is this decorrelation, decorrelation between our production regime, what's going on, the, on w the way we create value nowadays, and our institutions. I mean, in a way, you know, it reminded me of the concept of digital labor. You know, uh, Esco, when you were talking about these ongoing asymmetrical relations, it's like we've imported into the digital slash social era, I mean, call it whatever you like, but we've imported the, n the old relations of domination, we're just replicating. I mean, there are new ways of alienation that are being invented right now for the digital world. So I guess the question right now is, how do we move away from this past? You know, how do we just push away this future, this algorithmic control? I mean, that's terrifying, that's completely dystopic. So we have 15 minutes left. What, what's the plan to move to the new paradigm so to make it real. You're gonna love this. I think the first step is sure. calling bullshit, right? Calling bullshit when you hear the model. So how many of you look at HuffPo and see it as a tremendous success? It's a form of digital sharecropping. A bunch of people contribute content, only a very few people made money off of that content. Uh, Uber, it's a race to the bottom of how little someone can earn while Uber grows money. So when you see economic models that are extracting value off the backs of many people and never caring about the commons, you ought to sit there and go, no, we ought to not celebrate that, right? So people all the time ask me if I can use Uber when I'm in a foreign city. I'm like, yeah, I wrote a Time article that turned out to be one of the top 10 red pieces that week that I wrote it, which is kind of a big deal on the web. And so I was like, yeah, and it was about Uber and how no one should use Uber. So now I can never use Uber even in cities when I really would benefit from using Uber because I'm like, I'm personally protesting, right? So how many of us sit there and support companies individually, right? This is about individual action. How many of you support companies where you kind of know, yeah, they're kind of taking advantage of everybody? And support, you would not want to be treated by using that way. It? Yeah, by yeah. using it, right? I mean, you're supporting them by giving Travis money. Yeah. God bless it. And so, so this is where Thank I just- Thank you for being honest. I just really want to ask you, if you were on the receiving end of that thing, would you want to be treated that way? And if you would not want to be treated that way, why are you rewarding that behavior? Because as soon as Travis is successful, you have now sent a message to the marketplace for every other next entrepreneur to say, I can get away with it. And then we continue to worry why no one's protecting the comments, right? So that's one piece I really think we have to start putting our own actions into alignment with our values. And the second is, I think we ought to think about what are the policies in place that protect people? And this is actually a very non-libertarian, non-US point of view. Like here in France, um, Google's being audited and asked a lot of questions about how they're protecting the privacy of people. And people in America are like kind of offended, right? Like, how dare you ask us this question? And I'm like, no, there's two sides of it. One side is business. One side is who protects the interests of people. So remember, business people have never, ever voted for the interests of the commons. They were not the ones who protected child slavery, uh, slave labor or child labor. It was government 
that protected the interests of those people. An eight-hour work week did not come along because some work person said, oh, I should be a kinder, gentler person. It came along because government said, no, we need a set of policies. So when, when nobody's protecting the interests of people and you're not helping the government do that, which I know we share has a nice political bent to it, so I want to say it here, then we're also not saying, help us manage the commons. We ought to do that, right? Thanks, Go. How do we actually go where we want to go? So um, you have to redesign your thinking regarding growth, productivity, and meaning of work. And you have to design work around platforms, whether they are something else or like Ubers, meaning that they are the commons of work. Then you have to understand algorithmic capabilities and the hugely important thing, which I call contextual interaction. And again, this is something as a thought experiment that I very much would like you guys to think. Whether actually our measurement ideas are something that we don't need in the world of a unique and process type value creation. Because why measure if something is totally unique and context specific? I Tim, I'm pretty uh, sure you agree with that. No, I do agree with that. Uh, I, I think it's also maybe a good time to talk about universal basic income, right, on the on the policy level. So I, I, I see sort of there's an individual liberation that I that I can envision, which to me has a lot to do with uh, transcendence, uh, which can be a very small space, right? Just creating space for very context specific interactions um, that allow individuals to move beyond the narrow confines of the algorithmic measured. Uh, organization, right? It's not going to be a revolution, but just creating space for that in organizations can happen in parallel to other paradigms. I think that's one thing that's really important if we all uh, promoted that and did it in our own work lives. And I think the second at the societal level is universal basic income, making sure that people who can no longer compete for their jobs, right? There's a difference between jobs and work, for their jobs with um, machines on, on the grounds of efficiency and productivity, to decouple that and uh, give them a foundation by providing them with 1,000 you know, US dollars per month, as it is discussed in the States, uh, a universal basic income to basically then pursue more complex, more creative, more emotional uh, um, endeavors, right? Very much so, uh, I think, as it was the case in the, in the Romantic Age. Uh, and then have, um, you know, depressure basically, um, you know, the workforce and contribute, I think, to a new social contract, which we, I totally agree with Nilofa, urgently need. Yeah, because uh, right now it's like our old social contract is cr is falling apart because of the because of automation, uh, because of the fact that jobs are, ju are just disappearing. Um, you guys already talked about that. It's true. Maybe do you think we should acknowledge once and for all that in the post-industrial era there will be there won't be a job for everyone, and that's. No big, maybe that's no big deal, and maybe if we can adapt to I social totally structures. Disagree. I you totally disagree. I totally disagree. I like people, but we I have like to, when people disagree. We have on stage. to rethink what work is and what jobs are. They are relations to what people do with other people. And this is, this is precisely why this is so important because if we think that there's not going to be work for everybody, then. Oh, jobs, jobs. Well, job, I job is an industrial era thing. We shouldn't talk about jobs anymore, I anyhow. Okay. Nilofa, you wanted to react on that? Um. <laughs> you can never agree. No, so I think the thing is, how do we actually enable people to do good work? That's the main thing. How do we allow us to do creative work and what that looks like? So I actually, when I, when I wrote Social Era, I had one thesis about this, and I'm not sure I really changed my opinion, although I'm, I'm still processing on it, which was that we may need three types of work. One is... Um, like, I don't want my accountant to be super creative, for example, right? On the, on the inner part of the business, I really want that person to be as consistent as possible. That's and better. Then, you can have problems with the law and with the tax, uh, tax authorities. Well, yeah, I'm just, I want someone to be like, you know, do the thing, get really good at it, get it routinized, whatever. Like, but, but be able to be, um, take the new information and apply judgment to it, right? So there's that type of job. Then there's the next level of job, which figures out, okay, who's even the right project team to uh, do something? So you are acting in a, a curation role to say, if I'm going to go influence a 1,000 people to go change our economy, what is the conference topics and conversation set we need to have, right? So you're playing a curation role. And then there's like the work of ESCO and Tim, which are thinking about what could we do, what are the infrastructures I'm doing research around, it, right? So, and we're, we're kind of pushing the envelope by the way, none of which is paid for, 
right? Most of the work that you and I are doing and thinking work is not paid for, but when someone does pay us, man, they pay a premium, right? So there's sort of different levels of work. Notice that the stuff that's automated isn't even included in that. So I'm gonna assume for a minute that there is gonna be automated work that replaces everything that is possibly automated. And then the question is, where do you play in the role? All of those three, by the way, are relational. The accountant has a relational ship with the clients. Uh, the person who's playing the curation role is playing a knowledge set role. And then those who are experts are gonna play a different role. They're all creative-based uh, work. Um, because I'm assuming that that is, that is the kind of work we're gonna have in the future. Tim, you, you were mentioning uh, her by Spike Jones uh, in, your, in your keynote. And what's the job, of, I seem to remember, the job of uh, Joaquin Phoenix in, in the film is like writing love letters in, uh, instead of people, right? Yeah. That's ki the kind of jobs we could have in the future, according to you? Love letters to operating systems? Love, well, <laughs> maybe love letters to strangers and a stranger is an operating system. I don't know. I, I, I think, I mean, we're, we, I, I just read this morning, like, uh, you with unemployment in Spain is, what, 45%, I think, in the first quarter? Uh, I mean, it, there, there, this is a big issue, the, the youth unemployment, of course, um, and we are, if you look at the, the tech sector, we're not creating enough jobs right now, and we won't be in creating enough jobs because of automation, which means that we have to really rethink a model and create opportunities for work, <laughs> which is not the same as, as, as jobs, right? And that work, work you know, can be paid problems. or is not paid. You know, if we have universal basic income, the work does not need to be paid. You know, it's sort of in addition to universal basic income. But I think I, I don't really see any other uh, policy solution out of that uh, uh, sort of uh, paradox. You yeah, know, because, you know, unemployment, I mean, we are obsessed with the uh, political question of unemployment in Europe. In France, it's about 10 percent, 25 percent. It's youth unemployment is 25 percent officially. Um, but it's also a psychologically dama damaging phenomenon, like much like bullshit jobs, you know, because people are feeling guilty. Everything is made for is made so as people, well, feel, will feel guilty because hey, you're out of job, you're you're useless, you're, and right now it's like you know there was a very controversial uh, bill that was passed in France in force without any vote from the parliament, but work and and you know politicians are always talking about the figures, you know, like, like accountants about this is a rate of unemployment, so this is the productivity rate, this is our level of competitivity, and th the the beginning of the revolt against this law was. Uh, through a hashtag on YouTube called On Vaut Mieux Ça, which was, uh, which means basically we are better than that. And people were actually talking about sharing their daily experience, their daily humiliation in work. And uh, how, I mean, how do we switch? Because right now people are just threat constantly threatened with unemployment. You know, you're going to go to Pôle emploi, you're going to go there, and it's going to be going to be terrible for you. How do let we me, switch let me try that? To, let yeah. me try to say something, a uh, comment Please. to this. I, I think there are two uh, obstacles that we again and again create for ourselves. And one is the idea of jobs, that, that work is about getting a job. And if you think this way, that the second mistake you make is you say that, okay, then there has to be an employer and an employee. And what that does, it creates thin markets of work. And instead, and this is something we try to do in Spain and North Africa at the moment, is try to create richer markets, meaning that you don't, as an ex-employee, you don't try to connect with an employer, you try to connect with a customer. And that's why we emphasize that work is not about jobs, but work is about solving problems. Because there's never-ending amount of problems and if that is then the base, then it, we, it, it kind of brings us back to the basic human right of everybody being part of society. And everybody should have the right to do meaningful things with meaningful people in meaningful ways. So it's kind of reframing the whole picture of work. It's also so talking about sorry. jobs does not help us anymore one cent. It's, it's also about expanding the space for, for possibilities, not just having one career track, right? having these slash... Uh, identities and you know and uh, interesting enough I think there's also right now so much emphasis on entrepreneurship right so we have this craving for identity so part of uh, you know what you described is yes the humiliation of losing a job and not having a status and not being recognized as a valued member of society but it's also a sense of disorientation and we're just looking constantly for these role models these formulas these templates and I have a feeling among Gen Y and maybe Gen Z already it is 
you know, I don't know if it's okay to, to quote Michel Oleberg in, in Paris, but he, he, he phrased this, he coined this beautiful line and said, the culture wars are over, Entre entrepreneurship has won, <laughs> which I think really rings true to me. Now, you know, entrepreneurs are the new aristocrats. Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur and needs to be a startup founder almost. Like, otherwise, you have no value. You're not sort of really capitalizing on your potential, which I think is also dangerous. So I think the more space we open, the more possibility we allow, the more space there is for otherness, for going another, uh, pursuing another track. I think that Between is the onlyness and otherness. Yeah, the kernel of, well, of, a, so of, a, of civilization to me. So onlyness is, is to me the reason why I actually used it is because I was playing against the contraposition of otherness. So how many of us do not have a seat at the table of life because we are told that our idea is too weird or too wild, right? What we see is not important because what, what we're sold about is the ideas of Silicon Valley. So if I only am looking for the unicorn idea, then I don't pay attention to the thing that's right in front of me. Um, I'm reminded of a, of a young woman um, whose daughter, uh, she ended up dropping off at a, a, a code camp, and she, said, uh, and she said she realized her daughter would be the only black person in the school, and she felt bad about it, but she was sort of like, well, that's kind of how it is. But after a week, she thought, that's like what I grew up with. And then she started a little code camp at her house. She borrowed computers, she designed some curriculum, all in spare time, all as a side project. And uh, over the course of several weeks, code, you know, taught a bunch of young nine-year-old, 10-year-old, 11-year-old girls to code. And that has still now spread, and she's trained something like 8,000 of them, and she's on mark to hit a million by 2020. Um, the thing, because she's set up a whole bunch of other mothers in other cities who wanna do the same thing. And so the thing is, if she had not given herself permission, given herself her own idea, which was born out of her history and experience, her visions and hopes, her onlyness, she would never have done that work, right? If you listen to the majority narrative, you never give yourself your own idea. And actually, if you accept the narrative of an other, then you actually believe that you don't have a seat at the table of life. So what I'm saying is each of us actually has a spot regardless of whether or not anyone else acknowledges it, that spot that only you stand in is not a liability now, it's a strength, and we need to use it. I couldn't find a better way to, start to, to finish this discussion. You know, people applauded before it was over, so that's quite perfect. If you guys want to add something, you know, I, it's something just pops up in my head. I was thinking about this philosopher called Matthew Crawford, you know, because it, this guy, you know, the uh, soul cycle, yeah, no, soul, um, soul, soul, soul craft, and soul craft has, yeah. Uh, yeah, basically saying that he, he was a guy like me, you know, in a way, walking, uh, we don't, he, do, doesn't, he didn't know what he was doing as a job, and he decided just to completely switch and to open a motorcycle repair shop, you know, to learn an actual trade. And I feel like, do you think this is completely reactionary? Uh, that's really backward thinking, or that we are going to see more and more people like me opening restaurants, opening bars, re motorcycle repair shops. Uh, does it mean anything or is it, stu is it stupid for you? Very quickly because it's just a way to open, you know. Well, you know, we saw a story yesterday called La Rouche uh, that was on stage and I've been studying them for a while. I'm fascinated by it. We have supermarkets in the world, so it looks like that problem's solved. And here they're saying is no, we actually have an opportunity to build a relationship with farmers. We have an ability to pay them better, to get to know our community, to actually meet one another. And it's such a, it's such a, it's it's something that was quote unquote solved. And yet here's this beautiful approach of relationships. Tim's uh, beautiful notion of relationships coming back into it. Right, relationships are to the social era what efficiency was to the industrial era, which is a relation. And relationships are fundamentally built on trust which means that you get to go and be personal with one another and show up with one another. And I think we want, every single one of us wants that. We want to show up ourselves and then we want to be seen with other people. And so that to me suggests that your answer is right. We are going to open up more interesting things ourselves. So Tim, shall I embrace romanticism or <laughs> up on a motorcycle shop? Well, I think the, the, the value of things stems from the meaning that we imbue, right? And if, if that's a motorcycle or if it's a startup or it's a, an abstract task, it, it doesn't really matter. And I think what it shows is there is a, uh, a longing for nostalgia. Uh, and nostalgia, many people think it's, it's a longing for a time gone by, but it comes from the Greek and it means uh, pain from an old wound. So it describes a, some, something fundamental, um, an essential aching for a profound truth that we have disconnected from and that caused alienation. And I think by 
uh, honoring the craft, uh, by building something, by writing, whatever it is, as long as we do something that is meaningful, that we give meaning, I think then we have that sense, that nostalgic connection. And I think that, that I hope, is, is sort of a, a big enabler of, of fulfillment and happiness for workers. Thank you to all of three. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.